in the showroom. Today we are doing a video uh, really discussing how to visualize uh, our performances. And this is something that I learned when I was in high school. I was lucky enough to have uh, a few really good mentors that uh, assisted me in visualizing what I wanted to succeed. One of them being my own father, uh, my dad, John Harrelson, really helped me learn how to visualize things in a way that I could completely take them apart, put them back together without ever seeing them or touching them. And uh, that's a skill he taught me, uh, maybe somewhat unintentionally. I'm not really sure if he meant to do that or not, but his teaching style uh, really uh, led me in that direction. So today we're going to talk about that. We're also going to be using the pocket valves. So those of you who um, really want to see how these work, this video is going to give you a nice overview of how you can use these and in conjunction with uh, visualizing your performance. So visualizing your performance, you know, the majority of that comes down to getting yourself in a state of mind where you can imagine what you're about to do. And I take this for granted because I've been doing it since I was, um, well, a kid, since before I was a teenager. And that process of visualizing what I'm about to do has grown over the years to the point where I visualize everything I'm going to do, even this video. I sat down for just a minute and visualize what I'm going to talk about, and most of my videos are like that, where I, I don't write things down, I don't have a, a big outline or a big book, I, I just write down one or two words that kind of covers the whole topic. I kind of focus on that for a minute and I give you guys the information. So the way that uh, this really works is you find some time and some space, uh, mental space, where you can just focus on what it is you want to achieve. And that could be anything. Um, but on trumpet, let's just say you're going to practice your chromatic scale. If you're going to be practicing your chromatic scale on the trumpet, you could pick up a trumpet and play it, which I will do right now. And that is simple enough. <laughs> So there I played my chromatic scale, um, but what did I really learn from playing that chromatic scale? Is it easy to improve what I just did? Um, you could play it again, and again, and again, and again, and that is the most common method, is to just practice it so many times that eventually you're sick of practicing and it becomes a little bit easier. And this is why so often I see on the internet, on YouTube, and on Facebook and Instagram and other places and in forums, I see people say, practice, practice, practice. People will say, well, how do I get better at X, Y, Z? And there's always some smart ass who probably is a decent player that says, all you need to do is practice. Don't focus on equipment. Don't think about mouthpieces. Don't do anything but practice. And I'll tell you guys, those people, maybe it worked for them, but they probably spent a ton of time practicing and I guarantee you, you can become better than the people telling you that a lot faster. And all you have to do is not practice. Stop playing your instrument. Because playing your instrument all the time is most of the problem. Instead of thinking through exactly what you want to do and imagine a perfect performance, most of you are just playing it again and again and you're reinforcing the mistakes and uh, leaving in the things you want to edit out. Uh, the reason that happens, for the most part, is because we tend to get good at whatever we've done. Uh, so for instance, I tend to pause between thoughts and sometimes I'll say, um, see how I said um? That's one of the things that I do and a lot of people do that when they speak. They say, um, and it, for years it bothered me, I'd watch my videos and I'd see that I'd say um again and again and again. And then one day I thought, well, the easiest way to get rid of that is to just imagine speaking with other people or speaking on a camera and not using the word um. The funny thing is, I don't say um in front of anyone ever, in front of people. It always happened to me in front of the camera. And the reason it does happen is simply because when I'm speaking with other people, I'm used to seeing them react to me and have a conversation. And when I'm speaking on YouTube, like this live video that I'm doing right now, 
I have to imagine that I'm speaking to however many people are watching. It could be a couple hundred people, but I can't see any of you. I don't see you on the screen uh, and I don't have a real conversation. So I have to mentally think through how am I going to have a better performance on the camera. The other thing that's tricky for me is to look at the little uh, camera, which is off to the side. I can't look at myself. These are little things I need to improve, right? So I don't see myself on the screen when I do this. Instead, I see a little pinhole. And in the little pinhole camera, I imagine an entire auditorium full of people, which is something I do. I speak in front of lots of people in, in big auditoriums. So for me to do this on camera is a little bit different. My whole point is the way that I get better at it is not by getting on camera and doing it again and again and again. Instead, what I do is before I get on the camera, I think to myself, what's it gonna be like to look at that pinhole camera and imagine it as an audience? And then I think through that just for like 15 seconds and then I can do it. It's easier to do it if you imagine what you're gonna do first. So I know this little device and you don't need this little device, um, but if you're a Trumpet Momentum member, if you're an advanced member, then you get a set of pocket valves for free. Uh, you know, you can say that for free, or maybe it's just a, a bonus for being a member, whatever you want to think of. But I developed them for you guys, for the people that watch my videos and the, the members that are subscribing and paying. However, a lot of you are watching this and you're not a member and you just get to see this for free until we take it down and it becomes private. Regardless, you can pick up your set of pocket valves. I made enough sets to probably get a couple hundred out there. And um, once they're sold out, I'm not sure that I'm gonna make them ever again because they were quite difficult to make. Um, but I will have uh, more than we've sold already. So they launched on Kickstarter yesterday. And um, I think we have like 130 some people that have already bought them. Okay, so if you wanna set, go to Kickstarter. Um, or just go to my website, uh, which is harrelsonmomentum.com, and you can click on the link, and then you can pick up your set, just pledge on Kickstarter. But they are a lot of fun, they're really cool, and they were developed for this, uh, basically for my live videos on Trumpet Momentum. So I hold them like this, and now I'm just gonna position my fingers like normal, and if, if I'm doing it right, you're not gonna see them anymore. See that? They're gone, because they're so small, that there's not a lot to look at. There's a little thumb uh, indentation right here so I can stick my thumb in and then now I can practice my fingerings. So now instead of practicing the trumpet, what I'm gonna do is visualize, imagine, performing a perfect chromatic scale. So that's what I'm gonna do right now. So I'm imagining the pitches. If you wanna get really good at this, you could practice actually singing them. Whatever you want to do uh, in terms of your comfort level, but it's not a bad idea to sing with them. Another thing I like to do is listen to other people play a, a difficult passage or an entire piece and then finger through and imagine I am that player. And I have done that for so many years. I, I've been doing that for really three decades of imagining that I am fill in the blank, uh, Hulk and Hardenberger or Wynton Marsalis or whoever else. And I would finger along on my fingers or with my trumpet, but not play it. And I would imagine, like I would close my eyes and imagine I was doing that exact piece. Um, I usually would have the piece memorized or I had maybe transcribed the solo or whatever it might be. So then I could just go through and finger the parts at the same time. This does a number of things that are really gonna help uh, any musician and the majority of all really well-known successful musicians in the world have been doing this. Um, either they did it intentionally or they got to the point where they performed their parts so many times that eventually it became ingrained in them and they could start to visualize it. I'll give you two examples of that. Um, the first one is, uh, you know, just visualizing it. This is something that I did when I was younger. I was in martial arts. So I practiced martial arts for many years. And a lot of the things I had to do um, were quite complex and they required a lot of movement, but I didn't have a video camera and I couldn't really see myself do it. So the best way for me to improve my technique was to imagine doing it, watch other people do it, get feedback from them, 
and then eventually perform doing it myself after imagining many times. And that is actually how I improved very quickly doing that. Uh, another example of visualizing what you're doing even while you're doing it, but not intentionally, was um, years ago I played a show and I played that show, I can't remember how many times, like over 300 times. I had over 300 performances of one show. And uh, after about 25 or 30 performances, I found that when I was in the moment performing, I forget what I had done. I would get to a certain spot where I had to play and then 20 minutes would go by and I was done and I'd forget what happened in between. I could not remember the actual performance, partially because it was just like the performance the previous time. And so eventually when I recognized that was happening, which took me a few weeks to really understand, then I thought, oh wow, I know every single piece of this performance so well that I'm forgetting I'm even here. It's like I wasn't even alive. And that was disturbing, but then I started to find the freedom in it. And I realized, well, now I can visualize myself doing it differently. So it was almost like I was writing on automatic. And as I was doing it, I was thinking, oh, why not do this instead? And I'd harmonize myself. I'd harmonize different parts, take things up and down an octave, maybe embellish here and there. And then it became very easy and a lot of fun. But um, that was from doing it again and again, actually in performance. Most of us don't have that situation uh, because there aren't that many performers that are gonna play the same exact show 300 times. I do know some uh, performers who've played the same show over a thousand times. So that does happen. Uh, so whether you have uh, a practice valves, uh, the pocket valves or something else, you could just practice even on your hand, you can practice on your knee, but I want you guys to be imagining your performance. So let's say you're playing the Haydn. Bum 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 ba da 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 Whatever it might be, you want to imagine the fingerings and practice them while you're visualizing the most amazing performance ever. And it's not my voice, because my voice is not that great. <laughs> um, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time developing my voice. So again, what can really help is to sometimes record yourself even uh, let's say you're doing a chromatic scale, play your chromatic scale perfect, record it, and now the next time you do it, um, if you really want to hear the pitches and match them up, then it's better to play with a recording of yourself or someone else doing the fingerings and imagining it than to play it. And I know this is hard for a lot of people to believe um, unless you've really spent some time doing it, but um, when I was in high school, I was a card attendant at Target. So this is back when younger people actually got jobs. I know some of you still do, but um, uh, it's kind of gone out of style to, to get a, a job when you're in high school. And I worked all through high school. I was a card attendant. I worked in different departments. I did all kinds of things, but I had a lot of work to do and I needed the money, okay? So it wasn't like I couldn't go to work because if I didn't go to work, I wouldn't even have a vehicle to get to school or do other things or go to band or whatever it might be. So I, I pretty much had to go to work. We couldn't afford um, an extra car without me doing that and other, other things. You know, it's just the reality of not having a lot of resources. So I, um, I would go to work, but I was really set on becoming a great trumpet player. And I knew that I needed to practice several hours a day. So what I did is I'd go to work and when I was a car attendant especially, I would be pushing carts and gathering them and putting things where they belong and washing toilets and scrubbing floors, all that stuff that you have to do. They call you a cart attendant, but really you're just kind of a maintenance person during the day. Um, I did all that stuff, but while I was doing it, I was practicing my scales, my arpeggios, and I was doing all kinds of fairly advanced stuff for high school students without ever playing. I was literally going through all my um, different types of jazz scales and major and minor scales and arpeggios and then eventually pieces and then licks. Um, so I'd actually take a jazz lick and put it through the whole circle um, of fourths or fifths and chromatically and by whole tones and by minor thirds and major thirds. I'd be practicing these different patterns um, without ever playing them. So I'd imagine how they sounded. So I would do that in all different keys and I would never play. I wouldn't even vocalize unless, you know, I was away from other people. 
And I'd be fingering through these things and I'd be getting good at them. Again and again, I would do that all day long. You'd be surprised, just a two hour session of visualizing what you're doing and practicing the fingerings can completely change your life as a musician. Now, back when I started doing it, I usually had to think about the sharps and the flats and the notes on the staff, um, which I don't think about much anymore. So when I think, um, you know, two minor thirds, C to E flat and E flat to G flat, um, I don't think of what they look like on paper. I can just imagine the pitch and the relative nature between the, the different pitches and the fingerings. So if I want C, E flat, G flat, it's easy for me to put that in any other key. I could start on G, B flat, D flat, and I'm not thinking of the note names. I'm not thinking of what it looks like on paper. I'm telling you this because you may actually need to be thinking about it on paper. You might have to, but that starts to disappear. So let me play a little bit. Um, if I do this, and I put that into a different key, then I literally do not think about what that looks like on the page. I am just imagining how it sounds, but you may need to think about what it looks like on the page for now. So if I were going to do that and not play it, then I would start to put that through all different keys. It sounds like this. Right out of air. So I'm playing it right now. What happens when you go to visualize it? You're doing the exact same thing, you're imagining the pitches. So I just go through it and practice the fingerings. It's not the kind of thing that's easy to show you on video because, at least with these pocket valves, they're designed to go in your pocket. Let me show you. Here's my pocket. Here's the pocket valves. They're gone, right? Like, it doesn't take up much space. You can see, let me pull them out. They're very small. There's my pocket. So, it's not the best thing to show you on video. It's easier on that gravity trunk with the giant finger buttons, then you can see what I'm doing. But regardless of what you're using, you need to visualize it. So I'm doing that pattern right now. See that? And visualizing that, imagining how it sounds, will make you a much better performer. I didn't realize how important this was or how few people do it <clears throat> for the longest time. Um, when I was in college, I was a trumpet performance major and I studied composition, uh, like musical composition, but I also studied physics and psychology. And um, I was torn between a lot of different careers, but um, I was, because they were all so challenging and so interesting. But um, I had a professor who, at St. Olaf College, who, um, I, he was a, 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 he's a famous organist and pianist, and he plays with the Minnesota Orchestra. And um, he, one time I had some assignment, and I went into him and I said, you know, I'm having issues writing this piece and performing it on piano. And I had never had piano lessons before college, whereas almost all of my peers had many years of piano. They were extremely good. Most of my friends could play multiple concertos from memory in the school I went to, because it was a very good music school. And um, I went to my professor and I said, you know, I'm having a hard time performing and, um, you know, writing these pieces. And because the thing is, in our composition classes, we had to write the piece for piano and we had to perform it for our group. And we had to do this fairly often, so we're constantly playing these pieces for each other. Um, and I was having a real difficult time. I wanted to do it on trumpet. And he said to me, you know, Jason, um, the, you know, the, the challenge you're probably having isn't really that difficult. He said, all you need to do is imagine um, what the keyboard looks like and then practice it with the out being in front of it or practice it without playing it. I thought, that's the strangest thing I've ever heard. And then it clicked. It was exactly the same thing I was doing on trumpet. He said, 
what you should do, because I had a hard time with two hands. He said, what you should do is, is sit down at the keyboard, you know, look at it, then close your eyes, imagine exactly what the keyboard looks like, and imagine where your fingers go. And as I started to do that, I started to get pretty decent at the keyboard. And then I found myself practicing playing the piano when I wasn't even at the piano. I could be at lunch and practice the piano. And I could literally, I could do other things. One of the, thing, the things that he would do is he would come into the classroom and he would practice all of his scales and arpeggios. And I'm talking, this guy's a virtuosic pianist, right? And he would do it while reading the newspaper. He'd just sit and read the newspaper. And as he's playing all the stuff, he'd turn the page just gently. And I realized that he wasn't full of BS. This guy was serious. What you need to do is visualize what you're doing. And it's what I had already been taught before. It's what I had done on my, my trumpet, on other instruments, other brass instruments. The more I did that, the more I realized it's actually pretty easy. The thing that technically holds us back is the physicality of doing things without having thought through how they're gonna happen. Okay, so if I were, um, so I'm a downhill skier. If I were gonna ski a new run that was really difficult, let's say it has a bunch of moguls on it, a couple cliffs, and uh, some soft snow, some icy patches, so on and so forth. I could probably, on the first try, do that. I could probably get through the whole thing and not get hurt, and not fall. But, um, you know, that's because I've done it for so many years and I've worked so hard at being a good skier. But if I wanted to really nail it the first time, what I would do is ski down it, check it all out, look at it, see what it looks like, see what the terrain looks like, Make sure I'm not going to land on any rocks because I've done that before and hurt myself. Um, make sure that I, you know, I know how slick some areas are or, or like at least map out where they might be. So do a practice run so I can look at the entire course, just like I would look at a piece of music. Run through the whole thing and look at it. And then I would go up to the top of the mountain again and I would, as I'm going up, imagine doing a perfect run down that course. Same thing happens on a piece of music. Uh, um, music notation. So you're looking at a new piece. You've just slowly looked through it. You don't even have to play it the first time, but you can see what kind of obstacles and challenges there are. If there are a couple that are really difficult, you can visually uh, look at them, maybe finger through them, but you don't have to play it at all. And if you do that with a piece of music, and then after you've done it enough times to visualize a perfect performance, then you sit down and play it for the first time, you're probably going to way exceed your expectations. And that's exactly why I do this kind of work. And that's why I have the practice valves and, and other things that you guys will see that we do. Um, and that's also um, related to a lot of the things that we'll do with the um, parallel lip compression exercises where we're uh, forming the pitches and creating the different aperture sizes uh, based on the needs of, of the music. So, you know, you're not going to be able to master playing, uh, you know, three octave arpeggios unless you can understand and visualize what kind of input is required of your body before you do it. And right now we're just talking about fingerings and getting the pitches right, but we're also going to sync that up with your air speed, your air pressure, your aperture size, all these things, these things that everyone says don't think about. You're not going to think about all of them. Instead, what you're going to do is get good at each uh, different category and just synchronize them. That's all we're doing. We're not, I'm not thinking about them. My brain is so advanced, all of us are, that we can synchronize all these very difficult things and put them together. And that's how you create virtuosic uh, instrumentalists or virtuosic skiers or whatever it might be. People that are just amazing at whatever it is they're doing, they have mentally visualized how it's going to work. And that is true of pretty much everyone. Um, the opposite uh, of this, um, you know, on Instagram and on YouTube and a lot of other places, you can see some really epic crashes and fails, right? And there's lots of them out there and you'll see quite a few of them are, you know, really performed by young people. Uh, one that stands out in my mind, the category is uh, epic fails of people riding motorcycles or supercars. You see a lot of supercar videos where people just crash and burn. Sometimes they even die, right? If you notice, most of those people are doing things that you would never do. Uh, they're weaving in and out of traffic um, in an uncontrolled environment. 
and they're going extremely fast. Maybe they're playing loud music. They're filming it, which right away tells you they're trying to get attention. But what do they do wrong? Almost always they crash in some crazy way that, that could be completely preventable. What they did wrong is they, one, didn't even learn, a lot of them didn't learn the skills of driving. They don't understand the physics involved. So they don't even have a good foundation. Two, they didn't look at their course. A lot of times they are just doing this in traffic. It's a terrible idea because there is no course. It's too unpredictable. Um, three, they are really pushing their, their luck. They're pushing their uh, ability to the point where they cannot recover. And if you want to fail, an epic fail, all you have to do is get in the car, push the gas pedal all the way down and try to get through anything that's in front of you. You're going to fail. Professional race car drivers spend all their time when they're not racing on the off season, visualizing what it's like to drive. They don't, they're not allowed to drive. They literally, like an F1 racer, is not allowed to drive their car on a track the entire time that the season is not um, in motion. So the off season, they are literally visualizing driving or they're on a go-kart track and they're imagining how to do these things on a closed course um, with experts helping them. And that's my whole point is we can't expect to like fly through a piece of music and do it perfect. And if you do it again and again and again and practice it again and again and again, it's not going to help you nearly as much as if you slow down and think, what's this obstacle? How can I get past it? Let me work through the fingerings of that crazy uh, passage of 30 second notes or this tonguing issue. Let me practice tonguing it without the instrument. You know, you want to be able to do those things and visualize it. We want to synchronize our fingers and our tongue and our aperture to the music and to the performance exactly what is asked of us. Um, all right, so I've talked a lot. This is one of my favorite topics. It's one that I do in private lessons often because it is just such a game changer for most people. Let me um, pull up the chat here and now I can see Elgin. It's good to see you. Otavio, uh, good to see you as well. If anyone has any questions for me right now, I'm happy to answer them. I am putting together an email for all of you who are Trumpet Momentum members, the Advanced Series members. Um, I will be sending you an email to confirm your address so I can send you a set of pocket valves because you guys get a set for free. Um, they only come in black at this time. If you want the, the flexible TPU hand grip, you can buy that separately later. Um, but I should have these in stock for you guys and be able to ship before Christmas. Now, everyone that's involved in the Kickstarter, um, you guys will get yours in January or February, depending on when you order. Um, but Trumpet Momentum members, I should be able to ship those, I'm guessing the second week of December. Um, I'll double check and see what our production schedule is for the, uh, the hand grips because the hand grips are laser centered nylon and those are the only parts that have not been made. Um, I only have like six or seven of them right now, but the pistons, uh, that whole assembly has already been made. So, and they are like precision made, just like I would make my own trumpets. They're precision made pistons. Um, questions on visualizing, questions on incorporating this in your practice. Um, we're going to have a lot of exercises now in Trump Up Momentum. This is level two uh, after the six month mark where we're going to be spending a lot of time visualizing. We're also going to expand up to uh, G above the staff. So I know most of you have been like in the staff, maybe C and below for the first six months. That's been really important for those of you who have uh, embouchure and range and endurance challenges. Uh, so for those of you who've been going through that, you can now start to go higher. And uh, the goal is to be able to transfer whatever it is that you want to play onto the instrument, but first by visualizing it. So if I'm doing the chromatic scale, then I'm going to practice it without performing it. And then I'm going to take that into performance and uh, just continue from there. So on that trumpet momentum video, uh, or no, on the, um, the pocket valves video, I did this. <laughs> Kind of got it. This isn't my mouthpiece. Let me just switch it real quick. 
Okay, we'll put my mouthpiece in there. Uh, so I'm playing just the C scale up to G, so C, D, E, F, G. Let me move it this way. C, D, E, F, G, and back down. So I'm going up to G and back down twice. Then up to C, so I'll scale, the whole scale, which looks like this. All right, and then I go up to high C. Now, on that pocket valves um, video, some people are saying, oh, well, that was sped up. You know, he he recorded it slow and then he sped up the video, or the he sped up the video for the effect. No, I didn't speed anything up. I mean, the whole point of the pocket valves is to get good at this and then get fast at it. I mean, that's just how fast I play. So. That is literally how fast I play. The problem is, on video, you can't even see my fingers move because I think I did, um, I think I did 30 frames per second on that video. YouTube kind of has a limit before it lags anyhow. Um, but, you know, it just doesn't look real at first. But there's no reason you can't play that fast. And I know people that can play way, way faster than me. But the whole point is, I got there by visualizing it. So the way I learned how to play that was this. I practiced that. And then I worked through the next part, and the next part, and the next part. And I even added my tongue, all those kinds of things. So you need to visualize it, practice it, visualize it, practice it, go back and forth. Jacob, um, hey Jason, random question, but how well did the pocket valves work one-handed? Holding the nylon between the thumb and the pinky, um, just curious to see if it works as a fidget toy in addition to a practice tool. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it does work just fine as a fidget tool or a fidget toy. So yeah, you would just, if you want to do this, you can. You're not really going to hold it with that indent though. You're going to put your finger underneath. So you can do that, but I would caution you, um, you know, when you're doing something like that. Now, if you pick just, if you just get one of the pistons, because we sell just the single piston, let me take this apart so you can see. I'm just gonna pull this out of the hand grip and screw the bottom cap back on. Now, if you bought just one of these, as a fidget toy, yeah. I mean, you can play with it all day long um, and that's not gonna hurt you. If you're trying to hold all three and doing that all the time, I'll just warn you that there's a chance you could develop carpal tunnel um, because that specific movement is what can cause carpal tunnel. I know that because I've had carpal tunnel twice. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend, you know, holding this whole thing and doing it a lot with your thumb bent. So the thing that can really start to cause the carpal tunnel is this bend right here, because that puts strain right here and carpal tunnel syndrome really is inflammation down there, but it can also just cause other tendon problems. So you want to have your thumb bent out, which is why I created, um, that little thumb indent. So if you keep your thumb out, like you're playing violin, when violinists play like this, they hold their bow like this, they end up having a lot of issues with their ligaments and their tendons. They have to keep their thumb out like that. It's just ergonomic stuff that I want you to know before, um, before you go trying to do it, you know? So, but yeah, you can, you can hold it in one hand. You just can't hold it in one hand and easily finger um, complex passages, and I wouldn't recommend it because you could start to create an issue where carpal tunnel could be a real, uh, a real challenge. And once you get carpal tunnel, it can be really difficult to undo that problem. Um, I don't need to get into that too far, but yeah, here's what it looks like if I hold it just with one hand. So yeah, you can. It's just not something I would do pro prolonged period of time instead. I designed it ergonomic so that it would just lock right in your hand, and then you can put your thumb down there if you like. It's hard to see it, isn't it? So, like that. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. So that's the pocket valves. And like I said, pocket valves were developed for trumpet momentum students, which is a fancy way of saying my trumpet students or brass students. Um, and uh, there have been a lot of questions about sandal valves. Some of you already know this, but I did work with Arturo on his original sandal valves. Let's just say this, it led to a real ugly situation where I left the project 
And um, yeah, unfortunately, that's about all I can say without saying something that really nobody wants to hear. So uh, long story short is this is a, a pocket version of your valve set that can fit and, and go with you anywhere. It's lightweight, it's really high quality, amazingly uh, durable, high precision components. And while I have the first production run made and, and we have these ready, you can get one for a really fair price. Um, if I ever make another production run, they'll be 195 a set. And uh, I'm not sure I'll ever make another production run. So we'll see about that. Um, cool, any other questions for me? Um, questions about visualizing your performance. Uh, I'm curious, when you guys watch these videos, are you getting them because you clicked the notification bell on YouTube? Or do you find them when I share them on Facebook? Um, anyone who's watching this, you should make sure to subscribe to my channel, Harrelson Trumpets, and then push the little notification bell so you get the notifications. I don't do a ton of live videos, but I try to do one once a week to help you guys. And um, I do share a lot of stuff on Facebook to try to help you guys as well. Uh, the truth is I design and build trumpets and mouthpieces as a solution for brass players. So I do this, uh, these free clinics and these free videos and lessons uh, primarily to help you guys and also to introduce you to what, what solutions I have. Um, so this is how I make a living. This is what I do for a living is I help brass uh, musicians and um, my goal here is to help you any way I can if you ever buy anything from me great and if you never do that's perfectly fine I'm here for you either way but this is kind of a, a service that I do to help you guys be aware of you know the the advantageous ways of practicing and learning how to to do things on the trumpet and um, hopefully I can be here to help you um, all right we got a couple that are from YouTube Somebody says they just leave YouTube open. Um, cool, well, that helps me a lot. And uh, any of you others who missed the live video but you're watching this, if you could just write in the comments, how did you find this video? Um, and what would you like to see in future videos? There's a very good chance that what you wanna see has already been done, but I've done thousands of YouTube videos and they're not all published anymore. So I'm happy to, to hit other topics that I've done in the past, uh, once again. Uh, just let me know and um, if you have any questions on anything that I offer as well, let me know there um, It is our November to remember promotion. We just launched uh, The biggest piece of it today uh, So if you are interested in a new trumpet or a mouthpiece or a mod kit or any of those things We have them and right now for the, the last two weeks in November um, You can order a brand new custom Harrelson trumpet built to your specs with $500 down the normal deposit can be up to $3,000, and now it's just $500. Um, and I would walk you through all the options and help you get set up with a new trumpet based on your needs and based on your budget. Um, and just remember, our trumpets do start at $29.95, so they're not super expensive. But like that H-Series or the HB1 that we just released, um, which is right... Where is it? Oh, we, I think we sold the last one we had. But we have two more that are being finished. The HB1 is on our website, it's $3,200. And that's like five or 600 off the regular price. And that instrument, for, for those of you who want a horn that's way better than a Bach or a Yamaha, um, you can adjust your flexibility, slotting, airflow, all those things uh, very quickly and easily. On that instrument, you can make it as bright or as dark as you want, uh, just with the BGR system and the mouthpiece. And that, we, I think we have two left, so we had five originally. Um, sorry I don't have one in here today. And then I'll give you a quick just view of the other instruments that we do have uh, on this promotion. There's a beautiful uh, XV-10A. And the A is for that tuning slide. Let me flip this camera around so I can do it easier. There we go. Yeah, so that one's in polished silver and gold. This was a nearly new trumpet that was just traded in towards a brand new Muse. So it was made this year. Uh, the, the owner played it for a few months and traded it in. There's a brand new Summit. That's really the most popular model. Um, 
among professional players, and we have hundreds of pro players around the world playing on the summit. Uh, there's another summit. I didn't even realize we had this one in stock. Um, I don't know how I missed that. So, and then here's our Muse. This is a Muse in brass. Here's a Muse in silver and gold. So the, the lead pipes on these and the bells are completely modular. And you can put any of our bells. We have 20 different bells and 10 different lead pipes. You can put any of those on the Muse trumpets. Um, there's another Muse in silver. Here is a gravity trumpet. That's the one I just played for you guys. There's the XV1. And um, yeah, we have a lot of really cool horns right now. But I think, you know, we sold like three this week just as we've been starting to um, promote them. So rarely do we have any in stock. If you're interested in something we have in stock, just let me know. Uh, feel free to call 303-657-2747 um, or email me at harrelsontrumpets at gmail.com. Remember, this is what I've been doing for a living for uh, 26 years. And uh, I've been doing the R&D on this even longer. Um, so if you're serious about upgrading your equipment, whether it's a mouthpiece, a mod kit, or a new horn, um, then I'm here for you guys. You know, I, I've custom fit thousands of trumpet players to my trumpets. And uh, we have an amazing track record working with individuals, regardless of where you are in your career um, or your journey. Some of you are in high school, some are even in middle school. And some of you are 89 years old and you're still playing. Whatever it might be, I'm here to help all of you. And um, if you want to learn more about trumpet playing, if you're a comeback player or you just want to improve, Trumpet Momentum might be a good choice for you. And that's a subscription you can do on YouTube. And uh, basically, yeah, just want you guys to know I'm here for you. Um, pretty much, you know, five or six days a week. So any other questions? I should pull the questions back up. They disappear on me here. Um, thanks, Rich. Yeah, I appreciate that. So yeah, we uh, we don't normally have stuff in stock, but right now, like I said, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, we have ten trumpets in stock right now. So there's also an HT4 that I'll probably post on Monday. So if you're on our email list, you're going to get these uh, updates. And then that one's going to be extremely inexpensive. And I'm talking like probably under $2,000. It's a used instrument. It's very nice. Um, but it does have a couple little things that um, bring the value down, you know, just because things aren't aesthetically perfect. And it was one of our entry level um, instruments a few years ago. So, and then we also have a Summit One, I believe, that will be posted. And I think two more of those HB1, um, and those are really the instruments. If you're an, looking at an entry level Harrelson, uh, the HB1 and the H series are great value, they're great price. They, they start at around $3,000. And those instruments, because they have the VGR system and the limited edition bronze lead pipe, I mean, they are like several steps above a Bach Artisan or a Yamaha Artist model, and they literally cost like one to two thousand dollars less so that might be a great choice for some of you guys uh, if you're more serious about playing and you have the the finances then look at the summit or the muse um, thanks rich yeah you know I, a lot of people say they remember when i started and it's funny because um technically i started doing this in 1992 so nobody knew my name and no one knew you know what i was doing um, because i was in college and i was working uh, on the physics and the R&D and just learning how to be a human at the time. <laughs> so, but you can see some of the earliest trumpets I ever built up there on the wall. So right up there, we can see on, um, on this side over here, that is uh, a trumpet from 1998 or nine. And then the one on the far right is 96. That was the first complete trumpet I built. And then that one in the middle, I think, is probably from like 2002 or something. Um, but I have a bunch of my old original trumpets. And uh, most of you, whoever heard of me early on, were probably uh, finding me from the Trumpet Herald or Trumpet Master um, forums. You know, there were a lot of controversial conversations with my name in them because I was pushing the boundaries on efficiency and standing wave efficiency. And things that a lot of companies have been trying to copy ever since. 
But um, when I first came on the scene, there was a lot of criticism of my ideas um, just because they were new, you know, and they weren't really that new in physics. They, they weren't new at all in physics. My ideas were just new to trumpet players. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of that controversy started in, um, it had to be after I was a police officer. So 2001 probably, maybe like 21 years ago is when that stuff started. And um, it's interesting because the longest thread that ever existed on Trumpet Herald um, was also probably the most malicious. It was like a lot of people attacked my character. I'm talking hundreds and hundreds of people wrote thousands of comments. They were negative about me saying I was, you name it, whatever. They just thought I was a fly by night guy who like made all this stuff up instead of did, the, did my work, uh, my homework. But um, the longest running thread that ever existed on Trumpet Herald was about my trumpets. And uh, supposedly there was a server crash that deleted it. But um, you know, I know because I talked to the, the admins, you know, they eventually took it down because they just, they asked me once, they're like, um, do you really want this stuff up there anymore? And um, I was like, I don't really care. I said, you know, the negative press actually gets my name out there, which was never a bad thing. Because if you read my responses in the thread, clearly, um, you know, I would just write, you know, a response based on objectively on what's going on. You know, like, hey, somebody's saying this or that can't work. And I walk you through my research and explain how or why it might work. And um, I think people didn't like my scientific approach to designing and building instruments at the time. And some people don't even today. But I'll say this, um, you're gonna be hard pressed to find a custom maker that has as many professional instruments um, in performance day after day as we do. I mean, literally for our price point, because we're priced quite a bit higher, um, there's just us and Monette. And Monette is controversial for different reasons, although some of them are the same reasons. Um, but our Summit Series is literally played by hundreds and hundreds of players all over the world, and uh, they're pro players. I mean, it, they're played by other people too, but hundreds of pro players performing in jazz groups, in orchestras, commercial recordings, tours, all over the world. And, um, you know, we don't create pages that show every single person that plays our instruments. All you need to do is go out and listen, and you're going to hear those people. Um, or look at the uh, look at the albums, you know, because I mean, how many albums have our trumpets on the covers? I mean, it's hundreds. So uh, that is the reality. Um, I'm really grateful that so many people gave me the opportunity by trusting me to build them instruments, and uh, I'm even more grateful for so many of them that have come back and bought second, third, fourth, fifth instruments. Um, that's been great for us, and uh, it's just allowed me to develop the process and the technology, and that's what we're continuing to do. Um, on, in that vein, we will have a hybrid trumpet that comes out most likely next year, and it will have some of this technology of laser-centered nylon in it, and that can bring the price point down um, without affecting the um, efficiency too much, but it's always a compromise. Like for instance, the, uh, the Summit series, you know, we have parts that are CNC machines like this, tuning slide is CNC machined. The lead pipe, um, the bracing, a lot of this stuff is produced on very expensive machinery that's, you know, very costly to run and uh, requires expertise. And uh, the hybrid series that we'll introduce will be a lot less expensive than, say, a Summit, but at the same time, um, it will be a hybrid technology that allows us to get really fine playing horns in your hands and um, that's another reason you might want to follow us on Kickstarter because whether you buy a pocket valves or a pocket piston or some other thing like Spectratone mouthpiece on Kickstarter, if you guys follow us there and you back any of our campaigns, you'll be one of the first people to know about the hybrid trumpet when it launches. And um, that trumpet we have uh, right now slated it to start at $2,500. That would be... Um, let me think about this. I think a new Bach Artisan is like in the $4,600 to $4,800 range on Musician's Friend or Woodwind or Brass One, like the sale prices. Um, 
the new hybrid trumpet is going to outplay those instruments easily and uh, it'll start at 2500 so uh, we're leveraging technology we always have and uh, that price point doesn't give us a lot of room for profit but it does give us the opportunity to get a batch of those instruments out there to you guys so we can get feedback and uh, at the same time uh, give you guys really amazing quality and features so yeah backing the uh, the pocket valves is a great idea if you're gonna consider doing future Kickstarter stuff because after the first day at $2,500 on Kickstarter the price will probably go up to 3000 and um, you know so if you want to say that's the best way to do it cool any other questions on this lesson um, which is really about visualizing uh, your performance I want to thank you guys for joining me today Remember, I do try to do these on Fridays. Um, so as I was looking at my schedule, it looks like I'll be able to do, to do the next three Fridays. And then I'll be taking a break for Christmas, even though um, you know there'll be a couple weeks before Christmas and New Year's. So we will have a period where I don't have any live videos. Trumpet Momentum video um, production is something I'm focused on today. So I have several new lessons that are going up for the intermediate and advanced members. Um, and all you have to do is push subscribe. And um, then if you look at the, the, the area where it says subscribe, if you want to join as a member, you press join as an intermediate or an advanced member, then you guys um, will have access to all the new material and, and the last six months of material too. So, um, all right, great. I want to thank you guys so much and uh, I'll see you next time.